Hello, good evening, and welcome to the eighth edition of your popular webinar series, Starstruck. I'm your host, Ranganath Anand, Head Distribution, Wealth and Personal Banking for HSBC India. Today's guest certainly requires no introduction. He's someone every aspiring cricketer would like to be on the field, a legend of uh, cricket, John T. Rhodes. While he needs no introduction, let me share a couple of insights about him. Jonathan Neil Rhodes, born in 1969, is a South African commentator, a former test and one day international cricketer, and possibly the greatest fielder of all time. Played for South Africa between 92 and 2003, and we can all visualize him in the background, in the, in the backward point uh, position, ready to pounce on the opposition. John T. holds the distinction of being the first South African to take 100 one day international catches. He was also known for reverse sweep, and again carries the distinction of having hit the first reverse sweep a shot for a six. One of the few sportsmen this world has seen who's, who has excelled in multiple sports. So John T. also represented the South African national hockey team and was part of the 1992 contingent for the Olympic Games at Barcelona. John T. had his one-day debut against Australia in 1992 World Cup at Sydney. Incidentally, this match was won by South Africa by nine wickets. And true to what he is famous for, John T. effected a run-out in his debut match. And as we all know, John T. shot to fame in the fifth game of this same World Cup against Pakistan, where he ran out in Zimabul Haq by turning into a superman and jumping and flying towards the stumps and knocking it out and, uh, you know, getting him out. This is one of the most memorable moment that one can never forget. The photograph of this flying jaunty is still considered as one of the most spectacular feats of the 1992 World Cup and, of course, was a defining moment in jaunty's career. In 1993, John T. holds the world record of creating the maximum catches by a fielder in one day international cricket, five catches that he took on that day. And this record still holds. For us bankers, we all know that John T. also has a banking background, having worked for Standard Bank in South Africa. John T. was voted as the Wisdom Cricketer of the Year in 1999. And in 2004, he was voted 29th in the top 100 great South Africans in the SAB's Great South African Television Series. There are indeed quite a few linkages of John T to India. To name a few, his test debut was against India, played at Kingsmead, Durban. John T, as you all know, is also the fielding coach of the Mumbai Indian team, and we all love the IPL. John T was appointed as a South African tourism brand ambassador for India in 2013. And, uh, you know, one can say that you can take John T out of India, but you can never take India out of John T. And to that, his youngest child was born in Mumbai and named India Jean Rhodes. So, ladies and gentlemen, here's presenting the one and only John T. Rhodes. So, John T., welcome to us, and John T. is joining us live from Cape Town. So, John T., welcome. Thanks for being here today, and thanks for taking time to speak to all of us here. Namaskar. Ranga, how are you doing? Excuse Very me. good, John T. I am out and about in South Africa with the lockdown that we have, so I have to keep my mask at a very um, relevant level. Perfect, so, John T. And I'm not that's trying to hide to all... the fact that I'm getting older, but it's... <laughs> that's true for us as well. But fortunately for me, I don't have anybody around me, so I, you don't see my mask around. <laughs> so, John T., this is an interesting series that we have with, uh, with our customers, with our colleagues in, in India. And, uh, you know, quite a lot of them tune into this network of the webinar that we have, as we call it as uh, Starstruck. Now, you know, what I'm going to do is there are a couple of things. One is we have the audience who are going to ask you questions during the day and uh, they'll come in through the chat box and I'll read out those questions to you. But I also do have some questions which I want to throw upon to you. And, you know, like in true cricket parlance, you might get Yorkers, bouncers, uh, googlies coming your way. But I'll probably start with a, you know, a juicy half folly. Uh, so to start with, my, my question to you is, you know, so we talk, you know, in your introduction, I did mention the fact that uh, you did play for hockey before you came into cricket. So you've been a part of the South African national hockey team uh, and then moved on to cricket. So what really made you choose and move from hockey to cricket? And, uh, you know, we've also seen that multiple uh, people playing multiple sports is also very rare in, uh, in, in sports. But I, I do see that as a trend in South Africa. And I think what initially happens in South Africa is that, you know, we love our cricket, but we also have very distinct seasons. So cricket season is played in, cricket is played in summer, but along with tennis and, and also athletics. And then winter, we have football, we have rugby, and we have field hockey as well. So the school children, boys and girls, 
have to pick at least one sport every term at school. And these terms, the, the sports vary every term. So if you're a keen cricket player, sure, you can play cricket the whole year round and extra coaching if you want and at an academy, but you're also at the school. If the school's not offering cricket, you have to play one of the sports that they're offering. So you almost force them to do swimming or play tennis, um, play football, play rugby or play cricket so, or play, play hockey. So the amazing thing for me is that I grew up in a, in a family, three boys, with a father who was a, was a sports master, um, a head of department, and then a principal. And at the st same school that we were at, so myself and my two brothers, and we kind of had no option because we were the first kids in the school in the morning and pretty much the last kids to leave. And the two options that we had was one, we could do the homework with the boarders, do our homework, or we could play sports. And we just said, well, okay, school work's not really what we want to do. So we would play all afternoon um, in, in all the sports that we could. So the choice between cricket and hockey only really evolved much later. I was at university, uh, so high school, I was playing six months of cricket, six months of, of hockey, and at university, started playing state hockey and state cricket as well. And there was no South Africa during the years of apartheid. So I, I was a young man uh, during the years of apartheid regime in South Africa, with, and rightly so, um, political and sporting sanctions imposed against South Africa. So I had no country to play for, as many South Africans um, also had the similar thing. And, you know, so from my perspective, I was just playing happily six months of cricket, six months of hockey. And then we got invited to the World Cup in 1992, Cricket World Cup in Australia, because Dr. Ali Bakker, who was the CEO of cricket at the time, he had real vision and foresight, and he, he foresaw that the cricketing bodies had to join. Because also what happened then with apartheid, if you're a black player and a white player, you belong to different governing bodies, and the two could not join or play against each other or with each other. So Dr. Bakker, with cricket, was the only sporting code that actually amalgamated the two different boards into one, United Cricket Board of South Africa. So that meant that we had an excuse almost to be, to be invited back to play in the Cricket World Cup in 1992. And now what happened from a hockey perspective, the Olympics were held in Barcelona in 1992. So Cricket World Cup was February, March in Australia. And then June, July, August, I think, was the Olympics in Barcelona. So the Hockey Federation in South Africa, but again, they hadn't joined. So two different bodies, two different sporting bodies in the hockey situation. And they were hoping for a very late invitation to the Barcelona Games. And they put together a squad of players, of which I was one of those squads. But the invitation never came because we still were an apartheid-governed um, country. So Nelson Mandela was the first democratically elect elected government only in 1994 as president. So we still had two more years where only cricket was the one sporting code that was playing internationally. So it was less about me choosing cricket over hockey. It was more cricket choosing me. And I'm very grateful for the path that I've been down because, you know, hockey, it's, it's definitely not the same as a, you know, the hockey superstar as it is to a cricket guy who's recognized around the globe, especially in India. Yeah, that's that's brilliant, uh, Jonti. And in fact, uh, we're grateful that you took up cricket. Well, that's something that uh, we love you seeing uh, play from time to time. And, you know, what you mentioned about your childhood, I think, uh, you know, uh, that's something that you're fortunate because it's not the same in India, right? You don't force your kids to play, uh, you know, play any sport here. It's just that whenever you get an opportunity to do. But in South Africa, to know that uh, you didn't, you had multiple choices and uh, therefore you had the opportunity as well to excel in sports. So wonderful. So, uh, so let me move on and move to a different question altogether. I mean, uh, you know, I spoke about your India linkages and I also spoke about the fact that uh, you know, you are into tourism and you are the brand ambassador for South Africa. And I, I heard that you travel a lot across India, uh, you know, particularly riding a bike. So can you share some of that experience with us and how has that been? Do you enjoy doing it? You know, the most amazing thing, and, and as I said, Ranga, was when growing up in South Africa during apartheid, there was no mixing of races. It was against the law, basically, that's what apartheid was. The separation and segregation of people of different races. And, and I grew up playing in teams against opposition who looked the same, thought the same, you know, as me, white kids, white uh, young adults. And then when I got to play cricket for South Africa, when you're on tour of a country, you pretty much arrive, you, you play cricket, you see the ground, you see the airport, and you see the hotel, and then you leave. You hardly had a lot of security around the team. So you hardly have any chance to mingle with the population and, in fact, immerse yourself in the culture of that country. 
so since I have now retired and I am just coaching with Mumbai Indians, I made sure that every single IPO, I would borrow an Enfield. So I, I didn't own my own Enfield, but whatever city I was staying in, I'd give the, I mean, a, a 10 I based organization, I'd give them a call. You know, I, I love the classic, the 500 CC. And then I would get out and as much as possible, even ride to practice. The day of the game, there's too much security, too many people. And I would just get on the team bus. But at, on the way to practice, I would hop on the, you know, sometimes Hyderabad, you would drive for 25 to 30 minutes. And uh, Vankedi Stadium for me was just around the corner. So pretty easy. But I love being on, on the end field. So, and because it meant that you experience the country that you're in firsthand. And I think that's been, it's been a key element of, of what I've learned as a coach. You know, obviously, as a coach, you're trying to impart your knowledge and your expertise on young players and, and teasing players. But the one thing that, that I have really learned is that the more you learn about other people, the more that you learn about yourself. So I've, I've really been on this learning journey, and it's been through contact with you know, people talk about diversity in incredible India, and they are so spot on. It's not just from state to state. It's even within states, you know, different dialects, the way people prepare their food, the different menus or what's on offer to eat. And I think from that perspective, my time in India as a coach, it just you know, it's kind of highlighted the fact to me that I missed out a great deal as a cricket player where I was touring a lot more to different countries and different cultures where you never embraced them at all. You just kind of got there, you did the job, and off you went, you went home again after three months. And I think that's why I got involved with the tourism, is that I've seen this change now in people's understanding of what tourism is. It's not about going to a country, you know, going there, ticking off the list of the, of the five things you have to do or, or taking a picture or now a selfie of you in front of Table Mountain. Tourism has certainly become an experiential um, journey. And, and it's, without immersing yourself in the culture of the city or the country that you're visiting, it's very, very difficult to experience, um, you know, any shift or change or, or somebody else's point of view. So that was what I was enjoying about the tourism. Because South Africa is quite an easy country to sell, I must confess. We have, you know, it's a bit wintry here, here now in Cape Town, so it's a little bit cold. But for me, as a surfer, um, the waves are picking up. We get storm swells, so I can't wait to get back in the water. It's going to be pretty amazing. And, um, you know, it's a, we have so much on offer from a tourism point of view, um, not just visual side, but also connecting with different cultures within South Africa. So it was very easy for me to sell South Africa to the Indian audience whenever I had the opportunity as a brand ambassador for South African tourism. So that's brilliant, uh, Jonti, and you've been a lucky guy to that, that you've been seeing, you've been able to see the countryside uh, within India as well. You know, while I have a lot more questions, I think the audience uh, really love to ask you those questions. So I've got, uh, I've, you know, started getting some questions across. So let me ask the first one from the audience today, which is from uh, Sarvesh Prohit. Uh, he says, your daughter has a beautiful name. Curious to know, why did you name your daughter India? Thank you for the question. It, it's a, that is interesting because my wife and I, you know, we, we, we had very different reasons for calling India, India. I mean, my wife is a yoga teacher. Um, before she met me, she had never been to India. It had always been a place that she wanted to become. She practices Vedanta philosophies. So for her, India was a real um, spiritual pilgrimage, uh, if you could call it that. And I mean, she spent time in Rishikesh, Tiruvannamalai, uh, down, the, uh, down the, yeah, yeah, in Tamil Nadu. So, and on her own, you know, she's gone there, she's walked around the mountain, a full moon with a million people. So not really on her own, but not with me. You know, so she's gone there, not as a couple, just as, as, a, as almost as a pilgrim. So, so for Melanie, my wife, calling India, India was a very spiritual reason. And, and for me, it was more about Again, back on the end field, when you leave Vankeri State, or you, when you leave the hotel, we would stay at Nariman Point, we would turn right onto Marine Drive. And every day without fail, there was something different. So, you know, and, and that was a key for me. I've seen some of the sporting greats in India, that their sons then come through the ranks and they start playing cricket and there's lots of pressure on these poor young men to be like their fathers. And um, you know, the, the key with me was that I wanted India to tell India that you know, every day she must make her own choices because I'm going to embrace whatever happens because you're often told as an international sportsman or woman that you must seize the day, carpe diem, you know, to make the most of, to sort of, yeah, take, take hold of, of the situation and make it your own. And I find that in India, the problem with that is that if you come with preconceived ideas or expectations, you either overwhelm because India really is with a billion, over a billion people, it really is yep. in your space, or you're disappointed. And I think the key for me is that instead of saying seize the day, I've, 
and just through my travels in India, I've been of the, and through my wife, you know, with regards to Vedanta, um, it's been more about embrace the day because then you're not trying to mold what's happened into your expectation of what should be happening. And, and you're actually grateful for what is taking place. So that is my connect with India and the reason why I wanted India to know that every single day, this is her journey. I will embrace whatever she decides. So it's not for me to try and dictate or, you know, this is what you must be when you get older or I want you to follow in my footsteps because it is possible these days. I mean, women cricket has, has risen to such incredible heights to some international stars. India has quite a few of them themselves. So I am not putting her under any pressure to do anything because I will embrace every single day the journey that I see her take. So the decisions are hers soon. Not yet, but soon. So she is indeed a very lucky child, yeah, with having a broad-minded father like you who's giving all the freedom as to what she wants to do. And like I said earlier, like you can take Jaunty out of India, but there's no way you're going to take India out of Jaunty, right? So Jaunty, I'll move on to uh, my first uh, fast delivery for the day. Yeah. So this is something that uh, you had uh, advocated, I think, sometime back, you know, quite a number of years back where uh, you had uh, said that uh, you want to advocate of having fielding captains in T20. And I think you are also backing John Buchanan's uh, multi-captain theory. So is that thought still there? And uh, why do you think this is going to work in T20 or any other cricket for that matter? Well, I think, you know, John Buchanan was certainly a part of that. But we had Hansi Konya, the late Hansi Konya, who uh, was the captain of South Africa for quite a long part of my career. And he was, from a leadership point of view, it's so important. I think we've seen, you know, it's, it's where one captain used to captain the test and then the 50 overs, and that was split. Australia were the first. I think Steve Waugh became the first uh, one-day captain for Australia. Mark Taylor was still... And then you've got T20 as well. So suddenly you've got a lot of cricket condensed into the same time of year where you, you know, as a captain, you've got different squads to play with. Um, and on the field in the T20 game, to decide where to put the f- place the fielder, who to bowl next, who to bowl in four overs time, who's got overs left. Uh, this bat, when we spoke about him, you know, where his strengths, where his weakness, what was the bowling plan against this guy. So I think it's really important. And that with Hansi as a, as a captain with us, he put Gary Kirsten in charge of the, of the top order batting. He said, this is one of the best top order bats in the world. Alan Donald, fast bowler, good luck. You know, a, a great fast bowler. So Hansi just said, any fast bowlers are questioned. Alan Donald is the captain. If he's got a plan, he's got an idea, let's run with that because, you know, he's a fast bowler. He understands the situation better. And John T, you're the fielder. You are the fielding captain. If you can find ways that we can improve as fielders, um, as a collective, as a team, or as individuals, it's up to you to take us there. So I have certainly advocated it for a long time because I've seen captains in a T20 game. As a coaching staff, we can sit down at the innings break. And sometimes it's only 10 minutes because there's always a, a running over of time. And you can discuss over one, over two. And then it depends on who's batting, what, what happened in the first two overs. And the game plan often goes out the window that you've just discussed 10 minutes ago because the captain's got 10 different things going on in his mind. So with regards to fielding captains, it's more about having your strongest players in the best position. And in fact, I want every player to be their own captain, to captain their own position and be brave enough to say, hold on, I'm a little bit slower than that guy, let me get him to the hot spot. Because we, you can't always, with the field, changing left hand or right hand, uh, fine leg up, fine leg back. You can't always have, obviously, long on, um, mid-wicket, long off. Those will be your better fielders. But occasionally, just because of the way that the field has taken shape and place during the two overs, suddenly one of your slower fielders is in a hot spot. And it's up to the fielders themselves, firstly to captain the air. But if you have a fielding captain, the captain himself, he's not thinking about who should be where in the field. He's thinking about, you know, the position, the positional changes, the bowling changes, the opposition he's, he's having to face against. So having a fielding captain, I think, really, in T20, is a must. Yeah, perfect, uh, John T. And you thought of uh, every player being a captain himself and looking after his uh, strength and working on it. I think it's a... Uh, it's a really brilliant concept. So since you spoke about uh, captains, Jonty, my question to you is, you played under multiple captains, right? You, I think you started your career with uh, Kepler Wessels. You played under Hansi Cronier, Sean Pollock, Gary Kirsten. I think you did play under him and uh, Mark Poucher. Yeah. <laughs> One match, yeah. And Mark Poucher. So who, according to you, is, is your most favorite captain or the captain that you prefer to play under? And if so, why? Well, Gary Kirsten's got a great record because um, we were playing in Pakistan and the Wanderers. 
And after two days, uh, I think two of their players had a, an altercation walking back in the streets. And the Pakistan team called off the game. So Gary had uh, the ultimate um, unbeaten record. You know, we, were, we never even lost a session under Gary Kirsten as captain. The game didn't even last. It didn't last five days. Um, but, but for me, you know, Kepler Vettel is a bit like my father. He, uh, he, was a, he was a headmaster. And because he had played for Australia, and during the years of isolation, he had, he had immigrated and, and left South Africa. So the South Africans who, who were in the team that first World Cup in 1992, we had no international experience. Sure, we had Peter Kirsten, who played for Derbyshire. Adrian Caper had played for Middlesex or, or one of the, the other counties. And Alan Donald had been traveling a lot to play for Warwickshire. So we had some county experience, but no international experience. And, and Kepler Vessels was said, guys, you don't know anything. I will look after all the decisions. And that was just his makeup. He was also quite a, quite a fiery personality. He used to box and do kickboxing and not the guy to, to, uh, to mix with. And I think he's the same as a commentator. He's, he's, he's very forthright in what he says. But you know, then Hansi Cornier took over that. Whereas Hansi then had a team with players who had 50 one-day internationals under their belt. They had 20 test matches that they played. And they had maturity in the years as well. So he had senior players that he could call on. I think that was a difference. And, and he was, Hansi was definitely the first captain that I had seen, you know, five, six, seven years later, when it came to coaches were suddenly being utilized by different countries. Because before then, it was one coach, usually an ex African player who coached South Africa, or an ex English player or, who, who, uh, who, was, who was now coaching England or India, the same thing. And Hansi certainly showed that through man management and good people skills, you can overcome any, any background differences because we all, we love the game. We're all people. We all have various human characteristics that always come through no matter where you are. And um, Hansi's people skills and man management was incredible without us even realizing it. So he had, he had done a lot of research onto teams, into winning teams and how to get the best out of your, your individuals. So I think from, from that point of view, uh, Sean Pollock then took over from Hansi in quite tough and strained conditions. And, uh, and then I retired after Sean Pollock. So, you know, so I think from, from that point of view, Hunty and I had grown up same age, playing cricket against each other in the same teams from age 13. And uh, when he was banned, it was a really tough time. And then when he was killed in the airplane accident, it was even worse. So, you know, I think he, he and I have a very close connection. And the 1st of June was the sort of anniversary of his death. And, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of been a, it's been a long road, but certainly a road that Hunty made easier for me when he was the captain. Because for two years, I got dropped from the test team. You know, I got left out between 1996 and 1998. Still traveled with a one-day team, played the one-day game. Or if we, were, if we were in South Africa, I wasn't needed. Because I didn't need an extra 12th man. Get a local, young local player. So Hansi and I, he would always phone me up and say, keep going, John T, keep working at your game. Um, I had a technique, I had to change slightly. And he was really, really positive. So, so Hansi and I... Spent a lot of time, even after he was banned, spent a lot of time in his company. So we, we have a, a very special memory. And his results as captain were pretty good. I mean, Graham Smith was exceptional, but I never got to play under Graham Smith. I retired when he started, took over the captaincy. So thanks, thanks, John T. And uh, yeah, I think that was a fast ball, and therefore you left, left it outside the off term in terms of telling me who was your favorite uh, captain. But that's fine. Well, I'll move <laughs> <laughs> so I'll move on to a question from our audience. Uh, this is from. Uh, Srirang Halbe, his question to you is, Hi, Jonti, you are truly a trendsetter and you took fielding skills to a different level. I always love to see you fielding. I remember the, I remember watching the match where you took five catches. This was against uh, West Indies, I think, right? I wanted to know how you really developed the skill and uh, who was your role model? Thank you for the question. You know, the interesting thing was that I didn't have a role model. In fact, my role, the irony, my role model in South Africa during apartheid was Pele. I was a keen football center forward and Pele, Pele for me was the best footballer in the world. And obviously rather ironic in South Africa where the government had deemed that the white, was a, white people were a superior race. Um, but it was, you know, I think Peter Kirsten as a young provincial player, state player, I used to play against Peter Kirsten because we didn't have much television coverage of, of our cricket. There was no international right. cricket in South Africa. So the odd rebel tour, West Indies came, Sri Lankan team came, an Australian team came as a rebel team. And those players were all banned from participating in their respective countries after to South Africa during the isolation. So Peter Kirsten was someone I, I didn't see much of and then started playing against at state level and then played with him 
for South Africa. So he's probably the closest that I had to a cricketing hero because he was a very risky player, a bit like my hockey shot, um, a great gully and backward point fielder. And just, a, you know, quite short in stature, very similar to me. And, you know, took a few knocks on the shoulder, on the head, and was always kind of fighting through. So Peter Kirsten, if anybody, I certainly think was somebody that I, I really had a lot of respect. Thank you. So um, that's something for me that, you know, from a fielding point of view, I had Peter Kirsten not really as a role model. I'd heard about Colin Bland, but I'd never really seen him. And then I'd spoken to him when he was coaching one of the state teams. Um, then the reason why I was the fielder that I was was just because of the sport that I played. And we, we spoke about it earlier. You know, as a tennis player, you have to change direction to return to re return serve, um, to the backhand, to the forehand. As a hockey player and as a, as a, as a football player, I was sent off forward. So the goalkeepers would come off their line to try and stop me from having a, an easy shot at goal. So they would cut the angle down. So that, that was my role as a backward point fielder, getting in as close as possible. With Sean Pollock, sometimes as the bowler, wasn't that happy with me getting in as close as the gully fielder. But my whole sort of role there was that the closer I got, firstly, the, the batsman could see me. And uh, secondly, I was in a split jump position like a tennis player, able to move left or right very quickly. So by cutting the angles down, I really believed that I could prevent the ball from, well, as many of the balls as possible, from getting past to the boundary, but I would save the single. And the importance for one run for me has been, it's been a, something that, that stayed with me throughout my career as a player and then also as a coach as well. So I like to get in the space or in the view of the batsman, even if he is looking to defend and push for a single, he had to wait, hold on, John T. Rhodes is close by. Let me wait till the ball goes past him before we attempt a single. So the skills that I developed as a, as a multi-sports player, um, the hockey, the, the soccer and the tennis, allowed me to be the fielder that I was. And then it, it required a little bit of hard work too, because let's face it, whatever industry you're in, whatever hobby you're practicing, without a bit of hard work, you're never going to be as successful as you could be. There is no shortcut to yeah, success. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I agree, John T. And, you know, there's a saying that if uh, South Africa scores 200 runs, and if John T was on the field, it's going to be 250 for the opponents to score. Otherwise, they're not going to win it. Yeah, so we all know that. Yeah, so there's another question which has come across, and uh, I'll also expand that. So the, this question is from uh, Anand Mantri, and his question is, what's your advice to youngsters who plan to make great in fielding? And some fielding tips, please. But before that, I won't expand that. You know, uh, well, there are good fielders that I've seen, and I've also seen that fitness is really important when you're when, when you need to be good in fielding. But from you, what I did pick up is the fact that your ability, or your intuition towards where is the shot going to come, even before the batsman scores or hits the ball, was really brilliant. And I thought that was the defining movement to say that whether you're going to stop the ball, you're going to jump at the ball, or you're going to run off the ball. I've never seen you running after the ball, of course, because you always block it in that uh, zone when it comes towards you. Just that question, you know, advice to youngsters who plan to make it uh, great in fielding uh, and some tips for them, please. Well, I think the key with me is that you spoke about me um, anticipating the ball and or trying to be in the right place before the ball is played. Because I was getting in close, as I said, to cut the angle down, I had to be ready before the shot was played because there wasn't time after the ball was hit. So that's anticipation. So there's literally, I mean, there's two ways that you can be a better fielder you know, without actually catching a ball. Firstly is your agility. You do have to, because you can have the best hand in the world. If you don't get to the ball, you can't catch it. So agility, mobility can improve your fielding straight away. And that's a plyometric. So explosive power in your legs, changing direction. I have guys, I see young Indian players who are so committed to the game. They'll play for four hours or three hours in the morning, come back for two hours in the afternoon, and they're exhausted. They've given everything, but they run in straight lines. No changing. Fielding is it's not, a, it's not a linear game. It's a, it's a lateral movement that's key. And that's where those sports that I played were so important. So two areas that you can improve your fielding without even catching a ball is firstly, like I said, the agility. And second thing is that anticipation in a 20 over game, hunger, it's 120 balls. You expect right. every single ball to come to you. And you think about the shots the guys play. First it was the dual scoop. Now it's the reverse sweep against the quick bowlers. You know, everybody is, wherever you are in the field, the ball can come to you. So if you are expecting every ball to come to you before it's hit, you will be a better fielder straight away because your body is in a good low position, allows you to move. You know, you, I'll, I've done a lot of work with tall, fast bowlers, and at fielding practice, when they expect the ball to come to them, they move so well because they know, ah, oh, John is hitting the ball to me. 
But in the field during the game, they've just bowled an over and it was not a particular good over or it was a great over or they're thinking about the next over. And lots of fast bowlers are usually taller guys. And if they're not in a good body, low center of gravity, for them to move left, it's like a tree being cut down. And it's timber. They fall down to the ground. Then they hurt themselves. You know, Morne, Morkel, Andre, no. Some of these big bowlers that I worked with as a South African fielding coach for a while. These guys at fielding practice moved incredibly. But in the game, they were always thinking about the next over or the last over. And suddenly the ball is hit and they are slow to move, changing direction. So again... So, so when you're walking in the zone, do you also look at the batsman's footwork? All that is, yeah. is expecting every ball to come to you. Yes. Yeah. More sure, than, more sure. There was, a, the there, there was a follow-up so question which came... Language. Yeah. There, there was a follow-up question which came but, in the same thing, uh, John T. Which said that you also start looking at the batsman's footwork when you're going into the zone. I think the key for me was obviously that the ball is coming from the bat. So I'm watching the bat. That's where the ball is going to come from. Right. But his whole body... It's telling me whether it's a forward defense or a back foot defense, or if he's got his bat up here, it's coming hard. So if he's looking to defend and drop the ball for a single, I was already heading in. I mean, there's a whole lot of YouTube highlight packages. And there's one run out of me in, way back in 1993, I think, or Africa played against the West Indies and with Desmond Hayne. I ran them out. And I, I remember because I've, I've seen it recently, somebody sent me a highlight package. And uh, I actually took the first step. So he defended the ball. And I was now already running towards the ball. So before he decided to take the single, I had taken two steps already towards the ball. So that's anticipation. And that's body language telling you, forward defense or it's coming hard. So do I come in or do I prepare myself for a ball that's been hit hard? The really important thing that the entire body of the player can tell you while I'm still watching the ball. Perfect, perfect, John T. So anticipation is extremely important when you need to be good on the field. I think that's a message that all of us will take. So, so John T, we've been asking, I mean, we've been asking and the viewers have been asking a lot of questions to you. Do you want to take a pause and uh, throw us back a question? Something that, uh, that we can play back to you with a straight bat? Yes, I think so. Um, in 1992, that, that run out when I ran out into my pull up, in, uh, in Australia. I think it was uh, Brisbane at the Gabba. Yep. You know, those are days before the third umpire was uh, around in 1992. So, do you know who the square leg umpire was who gave out in the month by literally an inch? So, he could have rightly said, not out, given the bat from the benefit of the doubt. Who was that umpire? Well, that's a tough one. And I want the viewers to... Yep, that's a difficult one, but I'll want the uh, viewers to answer the question. So the guidance to them is, uh, you know, just uh, type in the answers in the question or the request box and not the chat box. Uh, and we'll wait for the answers to come our way, uh, John T. So a lighter question, you know, it's a lockdown period, but cricketers need, still need to keep fit and they need to do things differently. I've seen, you know, David Warner, uh, you know, dancing to Bollywood tunes and you see that in WhatsApp. You've seen Captain Kohli doing some bit of dancing and skills and that's coming up in WhatsApp again. So what is it that uh, John T is doing these days to keep himself fit? Well, I've done some work with, uh, with cold fitness. Obviously, people, the gyms have closed down all around the world and, and especially in India, South Africa, the same. And we've done some online working because at, at home because I have four kids. My wife and I look after four children every day. And if we don't expend that energy, we are in deep trouble. So, so we would even get, you know, India, India was born during the, war, um, during the IPL 2015. Then we have Nathan, also born in Mumbai, during the final of the IPL in 2017 in Mumbai. So we have four children at home during the whole, this whole lockdown period where we've had to keep them busy. And, and we've also found that if we have a little bit of a schedule in the day, um, up until lunchtime at least, till midday, then, then the day doesn't seem to drag on from the first minute that you wake up. And part of that schedule was always that we are very fortunate the house that we have has a very small garden, but it has one very big tree. So the tree became the playground. So our kids were climbing trees. We were doing exercises in the trees. We were attaching ropes to the trees and doing pull-ups and push-ups and, and as, much as much as possible. And then also, so for me, I keep talking about speed and, and, and mobility. And uh, again, a lot of power from the leg. Speed and power is, is really important. So, like I said, you can you can improve your fielding without even catching a cricket ball. But you also have to catch a cricket ball too. So we've we've stayed fit. My wife, we do we do yoga. So we'll just follow an online teacher. Once they once they ease the lockdown, like really tough lockdowns, you could go out and um, you know during the day on your bicycle to go and fetch your groceries. So I would choose the furthest shop to go do my shopping 
for groceries and then come back. So I would get maybe one hour of cycling in the day and I would go every second day to go and, and buy groceries. So as much as possible, we, we understand how important. I mean, everyone's talking COVID and, and you know, boost your immunity. You need to stay healthy, wear your mask, social distancing. But it's about test cricket. You, you've got to put in the work before. In fact, not just test cricket, any cricket. My wife and I have understood the importance of nutrition from a long time back. So we boost immunity in our kids by what they eat. Um, I have an Ayurvedic doctor friend in Mumbai that we're looking to do work with in companies because, you know, if you speak to an Ayurvedic doctor, he wants to know how is your gut? Now, what's the state of your gut? Is your, is your stomach healthy? Because when your stomach and your gut is healthy, that's where all the, the bacteria sit. And we all need good bacteria in our system. You know, so we've, we as a family have certainly made sure that while we respect um, you know, everything that people are saying about COVID-19 and, and the rules and regulations, what need to be adhered to, we also understand that children, firstly, need to get out, need to get outside. and need to, So we would sneak them out the back door for a quick cycle and come back because we have a very small house um, in a very small lane and there's only four, you know, there's, there's 10 houses, but only four people that are occupying them. So nobody in the streets. And then you, the kids needed just five minutes away from each other and away from us parents. So we, we, we incorporate um, activity into our lifestyle. And, and I think that that's important for us is that everything that we've done up to this without knowing that this pandemic was coming has certainly stood us in, in, in good stead as a healthy family, not because we go to the gym three times a week or four times a week, but just through our lifestyle choices. And, and nutrition is a big part of that. So that's what, uh, that's what we've been up to. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, John T. And for all the viewers who are watching, I'm sure these are some tips that they can take in terms of what to do and really interesting ones. So for the question that you asked, we've started getting some answers. You know, David uh, Shepard is one. Steve Buckner is the other one. We've also got uh, Sir Dickie Bird. Uh, is any of these answers right so far? Yes, one. One, one of the three. You still have to tell me which one. I, I'm not the expert here. Uh, you, you don't know. No. Okay, so you think of that, I'll, I'll give you a hint. He was the same umpire that in, in 1993, it was the first time when India toured, 92-93. India toured South Africa, that friendship series. I made my debut. Friendship and the second series. test match was in Johannesburg. So so, so was that uh, David Shepard? So, was that um, David Shepard? No. no, because then I was, so I was the first fielder to get a, 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 a referral run out. Do you, know, do you know who the batsman was there? Who was the first batsman out with the use of technology run out? Was South it Africa play in India. Was it 1993 Sachin? Has to be Sachin. <laughs> Has to be Sachin. The God, the, the, the God, the God of cricket Sachin. for India. <laughs> yeah, not, not a Absolutely. memorable event for us, so, but you did get him out. No, no, no. So, yeah, so he was the first, the first victim of the, of the review system. And then the next test match was in Johannesburg. And um, I'm not too sure who was bowling. Might have been Kapil there, but Javel Galshinath of all people. I was, I was, I think, about 17 or 18, and I hit the ball to mid-off where he was fielding. And I said, yes. And it was touch and go, and Javigal Srinath, of all people, hit the stump. And the umpire then, the same umpire who was standing at square leg in 92, he said, not out, but also no referral. So even though he was allowed to call if he wanted to, he said, no, he knew I was in. Maybe he didn't back Javi either to be, um, to be able to run me out. But it was the same umpire who stood at square leg in 92 with Inzabam, who uh, I would have been the second victim. I mean, how's the irony of that? I would have been the second victim of the, of the referral, but he never called for the referral. He's from the West Indies. There's your third clue. So, so I, would, I would guess it's Steve Buckner. And, <laughs> and uh, he, he's been one of our favorite umpires as well. Right, John T. So that, uh, we've got some answers on that. And the first answer on that, uh, as the right answer, came from uh, Digesh Davda. So, Digesh, well done. We'll try and see if we can ask you a few more questions that you can uh, answer uh, to us. So, uh, moving back to fielding, uh, John T. You know, India is also, while, well, you know, uh, fielding really came into play when, uh, when you started playing. Before that, uh, most of the fielders were either chasing the ball or jumping after the ball uh, left them. And you got a new dimension to, to fielding. Uh, and over the years, we've also seen some good Indian fielders coming our way. Uh, if I can, you know, quickly name a few. We did have Kapil Dev, you had Ajay Jadeja, uh, Mohamed Zaruddin, Mohamed Kaif. Uh, in the current era, you have Yuvraj Singh. Suresh Raina, of course, I know he's one of your favorite uh, fielders that you mentioned in an interview earlier. Uh, we have Sir Jadeja and, of course, Captain Kohli being, uh, you know, really setting example for his players. So who, according to you, 
uh, you think is in the current lot in particular is your best fielder and uh, why would you say that well i, I think today stage is, is somebody freaky and so whether he's catching the ball or whether he's uh, affecting run out he's somebody who's almost uncoachable i think he's slightly unorthodox at last catch he caught in new zealand with the one arm above his head um he is so quick to the ball so he's very different to the way that i would feel he covers the ground so quickly and uh, he also throws a side arm throw which i hate but he hits the stumps all the time so yeah. you know it's a, maybe that's as a left arm bowler in in one day cricket you learn to bowl slide side arm just <laughs> slide the ball in so he has this incredible accuracy and i keep telling people don't throw like malinga don't throw side arm you know throw like a fast bowler and he he blows all my theories out the water so i'm i'm going to put him up there but as i've always said Suresh Raina is somebody who i've really respected and have loved to watch in the field because I, i know how hard the fields are in india i mean the ipl you know the matches you just play at state level there's great facilities now and the outfields are fantastic but he grew up on some really hard outfields so to see him diving around very much like i did as a young player and knowing what he's going through every day on the ground when he hits the ground it's uh, i have a lot of respect for him i mean obviously for that colleague is a great athlete and it's So again, it hot kind of goes back to that the point I was making about being more mobile and agile makes you already a better fielder. If you think of Virat Kohli as an under-19 World Cup winning captain, right. the transition that he made as an athlete to what he is today is, is incredible. So yeah, his fielding is is also superb. But also, I think as a captain, you're under pressure because you're thinking about other things. So he'll he'll occasionally make mistakes in the field, and you kind of think, well, someone as good as that, why is he making a mistake? But you know, as a player, the captain is thinking about three or four different things every ball of the game. So, you know, sometimes he you'll be thinking about something else other than hey, the ball's coming to me. But Suresh Raina, I mean, Yuvraj right, was always the first. I mean, the golden arm, whether he was batting, hitting sixes out the ground, or taking wickets and breaking partnerships, and he's caught me out a few times as well, diving at backward points or at short sort of mid wicket or short fine leg. to turn a game around. You know, those kind of guys are, are great fielders. I, I'm always going to stick with Suresh Raina. So he's not playing as much cricket, obviously, for India. But yep. uh, I know that, you know, when, when, when CSK play, he's a big part of what they do with the bats and, and in the field. So I'm always, a, I'm always a big fan of Suresh Raina. Yep, thanks for that, uh, Jyanti. And I'm sure Suresh knows that uh, you really look at him as India's best fielder. And I'm sure what I heard from you about, uh, about Jadeja he is going to be excited you know extremely excited that uh, jonty the god of fielding thinks that uh, you know he is one of those uh, better fielders in the country uh, so let me quickly move on to another question which has come from uh, one of our viewers here this is from nilesh he says i jonty nilesh this side which was your memorable match that you played against india and in india also if you can tell us about any incident which makes you laugh and the best indian player that you like so multiple questions on this so which was your most memorable match played at against india and india and any incident that makes you laugh well i mean i must say every time i ride on 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 the enfield um doing an ipl as a coach riding next to the mumbai indians bus is always it was tricky because people driving in their vehicles are trying to take pictures of sachin tendulkar when he was playing you know sitting on the because they always sat on the first seat on the left hand side of of the bus so when i was riding the motorbike next to the bus because it was just too dusty some of the roads people come with their car trying to take a, a picture of of Sachin the driver of the car and uh, I would often have to kick almost kick the car away with my leg because I was now getting squashed between his vehicle and the bus so you know with regards I mean as I said I, I love India because every day just something different totally unexpected happens and and I've loved all of it um, an incident on the field no major issues uh, funny or unhappy um, but I you know I just think with with regards to matches in India the one game that i didn't play but i was actually was in calcutta in gone lawns clues the made his debut and it was the best debut for a, for a bowler for a long time he got zero wickets in the first inning but then got eight in the second inning but in that first innings where he was belted all around the ground mohammad azhar didn't got 100 in calcutta i mean those days before the world cup was held people there were no bucket seats so they squashed people in as tight as possible and i'm sure in even gardens they had 100,000 people watching Now, I'd pulled a hamstring in the test match before. So I was with the with the physiotherapist or the, the fitness trainer back at the hotel which was maybe 3 or 4 kilometers away from Eden Garden. And I could hear the crowd from the gym. But I said to the trainer, what is going on here? Is there, is 
you know, is there a riot or is it sounds like there's a massive crowd somewhere outside the hotel. And literally three to five kilometers away, the crowd were going crazy because as it did was just, we were trying to South Africa, trying to bowl wider and wider and wider outside all stumps. And he just kept walking across and flicking with those damn wrists of his. I mean, he was such an incredible wristy player, still flicking the ball. We had an 8-2 offside field, bowling, you know, wide outside all stumps. And he could still sit there and take the ball to the vacant leg side, even though Lance Klusner was bowling so far away swingers outside all stumps. So you know, not a fun experience, but just kind of, I think, encapsulates what cricket is about in India. It's just such such an experience. And whether you're in the ground at the same sort of venue as the game is going on, you are so infected or um, absorbed by, caught up by what is happening. So I'm trying to use the right adjective there. So I think that for me has always been so memorable in that every time I've been involved with cricket in India, I have incredible memories. I'm not always pleasant from a results point of view. In the, personally, I'm talking about because, you know, the reason why I used to sweep and reverse sweep was that I couldn't really read the wrong one or the, the Dusra and, and things like that. So I would happily right. sweep the guy, the spin bowler off his length rather than, okay, I can read which way the seam is coming out or the change of, of action in the hand. So, you know, it was always a tough place for me to tour in, in the test. But, uh, and like I said, now I've, I've just grown so much as an individual every time I've been to India as a coach because I've made it my mission to go out and experience as much of the culture as possible. Yep, brilliant, uh, Jonti. Thanks for that. Uh, what I'm also going to do is I'm going to ask a question to the audience so to keep the audience warmed up and active. You hold, I mean, this is Jonti's question, of course, that Jonti holds a record, and I spoke about it, for the maximum number of catches taken by an outfielder, uh, outfield player in a match. So the, the question to you is, how many catches did he take against which team and which year? So I won all the three. One I did answer uh, when I introduced Jonti. So how many catches? against which team and which year. So we'll come back to that uh, in a moment when uh, we hear the answers from, from our audience, from our lovely audience there. The next question from uh, one of the audience is uh, Basavaraj Gadikar. His question is, hello, Jonti. How do you manage or handle failure? And what was the biggest failure lesson that uh, you've learned? That is a great question. Because the amazing thing is, as a cricket player, you know, I, I think, as, as you rightly said in the introduction, you know, I work for Standard Bank in South Africa as a business banker. I have a, I have a Bachelor of Commerce degree. And so I've worked in the corporate environment as well. And it's amazing. The, the, the lessons that you learn as a cricket player on and off the field are certainly applicable anywhere, in any environment. And, and the one thing that we focused on as, as individuals, I think that we started becoming a successful team in South Africa, especially when we toured places like India, where you know, we would find that in South Africa, we were very accustomed to pace bowling, bouncing wickets, and uh, our three-day state competition you hardly saw a spin, the, the ball turn at all because the wickets were, to get a result in three days, they were green and seeming friendly wickets. So coming to India was really tough because every net situation you had, there was always 10 net bowlers who were about 12 or 13 years old, spinning the ball like crazy, making you feel like you just, you had six or seven. And now you have to play against India in a day's time. So it's totally demotivating. The wickets were dusty and, and, you know, we just, we complained a lot. And it was actually Hansi that said, guys, we really have to control what we can control. Focus on the controllables that are in our hands. And the key there was we then started working on the process, not the outcome. And I think it holds true in industry as well because we know that we can put in as much effort as possible. Um, okay, now with the, the DRS, with the review system, maybe you get a second chance. But, you know, the umpire could make a mistake. Um, the bowler, you can bowl a great delivery. As a batsman, you get one opportunity. You could make the wrong shot selection and get out. You don't have another over to rectify the mistake. You're done. That's you for the rest of the game. You know, so you might sit for 30 overs or a test match um, watching your, your teammate back while, while you sit in the dressing room. So we became, and, and that to stop this, obviously the most dangerous part, Ranga, believe it or not, is, is when you're doing really well as a team or as an individual. Because then you, you sometimes forget to learn the lessons that you're going through. So you know, when, when you crash a bit, then you realize you make the mistakes that you've made and you try and rectify them. But often, when you're winning as a team, the small mistakes, that you kind of gloss over them. So we are, as a team, the whole time, working on the process, not the outcome. Because even when you're successful, you could be a bit sloppy in the process. So what are your deliverables as a fielder, as a batsman, as, as a bowler? And have you put that in place at practice? Not just in the game. Because, yes, we all want to be successful in the game. We all want to 
win the game for our country and, you know, whether it's a World Cup or a bilateral series. We all want to be successful, but there is no guarantee. But there is a guarantee on what work you have done, and that's your work ethic. So when I spoke about players captaining themselves in the field, it's about taking ownership as, a, as an individual on your practice, the way that you practice. And, and that was, you know, I was very fortunate with my father as the teacher. He just said, John T, it's not practice that makes perfect. It's actually perfect practice that makes perfect. So practice like you're in a match situation. And that is working on the process, not working for the outcome, because we have no guarantee. And let's face it, if, you, if you're thinking success is scoring 100, which it is, supposedly, you know, then you, 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 if you don't score 100, then, you know, what do you do? Have you failed or are you down or hard on yourself? Or if you score 100, now you think everything's under control. But the next game you play, you could be out first ball. So, you know, it's a game. What is the process, not the outcome? And that's how you maintain emotionally a very stable sort of flat line um, as opposed to an up and down graph or uh, emo- emotional roller coaster as a cricket player because there are a lot of things that you can't control. So if you can control the controllables, which is you, the way that you work, the way that you, you know, w- deal with your teammates, the d- respect your position, all of that, something that you can control. That's the process that we look to work at. So brilliant, brilliant, Jonty. In fact, uh, you know, don't focus on the uh, outcome, but focus on the process. If um, my team in office was listening to this, uh, you know, they, it, it resonates what I think, whether it's cricket, whether it's any sport or an office, focus on the process and not on the outcome. Because if you get the process right, I mean, the outcome will take care of itself. Yeah. So brilliant on that, uh, Jonty. We're running sure. out of time. We've got about five or seven minutes, but I just want to have ask. well, there are too many questions from the audience. Just quickly on the answers. I think they know your history really well. Uh, the right answer came in almost immediately. Amit Soni from India answered first five catches against West Indies, 1993. That's right. Isn't it right? Perfect. It yep. So well it done, uh, well done, Amit. And so I want to ask you a quick question before I ask for some of your thoughts, which is the 1992 World Cup, South Africa, Pakistan match, uh, Inzimam uh, and uh, and Imran on the other side, uh, and the ball coming towards you. And, you know, that's the moment that all of us remember, right? Which is you flying like a superman and taking the stumps. So what was running in your mind then? And you saw Enzima, we all know that he's not one of the swiftest uh, runners. So were you waiting on playing with him? Or, you know, it was genuinely that you just went after the ball and, you know, got him out by flying onto the stumps? Well, firstly, I mean, we, we talk about the corporate environment as well. You also need to play to your strength. And I think it's important whether it's on a cricket field uh, or in a business environment. So you need to get your weaknesses up to a certain level. But the rest of the time, you really you, you need to play to your strength. And I, I didn't back my throwing at the stumps because we never really had, we never had a fielding coach. We didn't have these nets that the guys throw it down the stumps to practice. So my fielding practice was all about stopping the ball and catching the ball. And, um, but I had good speed. So, and fortunately, from playing hockey, playing football, good peripheral vision. So as I got the ball, it was a wet day because there had been a rain break. Pakistan had come back out to bat and, and in the mum, and, and, you know, not to say he, he had a great career as a batsman, but not a very successful one as a runner between the wickets. But it was the first time I'd seen him in So none of us had any knowledge of his speed or lack thereof between the stumps. And, but what I did see was Imran Khan on the other end put his hand up straight away to say no. So I knew there was only one side for me to focus on, was at, uh, at, back at the striker's end, at Inzaman's side. And I backed myself to get there faster than Inzi. Because even though at 19, he was quite a lumbering guy. So for him to turn around and come back and me running a straight line, rather than take a chance and, and risk missing the stumps, I knew I could hit the stumps with the ball in hand. But I didn't realize that he would get back as soon as he did. So for me, the, the fastest way to complete the last two meters was to dive full length. And firstly, Steve Bucknell gave him out because it would look really silly if I'd had the chance to throw and I didn't, and Steve Buckner said, no, too close, not out. And I mean, it was just out, so not, you know, which, which is a brave decision for the umpire to make in my favor. And also the second thing was as well, you know, I was somebody who I knew I was quick between the wickets. I knew I was quick across the ground. I didn't back my, my throwing accuracy. And I thought, okay, let me rather play to my strengths. And, and uh, it worked out in the end. It was not something I'd ever practiced before and not something that I ever did again. So... And again, that's pretty much what my father's whole philosophy about practice like your match situation. And 
whatever happens in the game will be because you've been practicing at high intensity for the whole week in the build up to the match. Not just suddenly you turn up for the game and think, okay, what is my A game? Let me, let me turn it on now because the lights are on and everyone's watching on camera. So, you know, a great piece of umpiring and a fantastic photograph. I just chipped in because I spoke to the photographer amazingly enough. Uh, it was, I don't know, 28 years since it happened. Yep. The journalist said, have you ever spoken to a photographer? And I said, no, because a guy based in, in Brisbane. And he said, he was actually, the photographer I spoke to him said, he was actually focusing on Inzamam because he said he could see, he kept one eye on the, on the sort of the viewfinder, one eye above the camera. So he could see something was going to happen. So he was focusing on Inzamam and I dived into frame. So... Because there was no digital camera, he didn't know what he had got. He had to send the film back for processing. And the first frame, my sort of hands came in. The second frame, my whole body was there. The third frame was just my feet. So in one frame that he captured me, clear as it was black and white, but clear, in focus, no blurring, instead of in the mum, it just, it was meant to happen. I mean, that's how ridiculous it is. And as I said, never did it again. Uh, absolutely, uh, Jonti. Thanks for that. And, you know, to me, uh, that's that memory is still etched in my mind. And every time I think about good feeling, we always think about that. And I think that, to me, that was the moment which made you the god of uh, feeling, to be honest. Yep. So, Jonti, it's been really wonderful speaking to you. We've got, we've run more close to the, close to time now. But if you want to leave one message to the audience, what would that be? I think what's important for me is that, you know, working in India a lot, in South Africa, we, we're a third world economy. And, um, and too often, we'll, we'll kind of sit back and say, what's the point of me getting involved? Because, you know, it, there's so many other issues that are important that need to be done, but it needs to be done by somebody else. It's, it's the MLAs, it's the chief ministers, it's, it's my boss's, my, my boss's duty to get it done or his job to get it done. And what I've seen and, and what I, my whole philosophy around fielding is that one run makes a difference. And, you know, I've, I've seen it not just as a fielding coach with Mumbai Indians because 2017 we won the IPL by one run. But in, uh, in 1999, the World Cup, South Africa versus Australia, semi-final. I still have nightmares about it. And uh, Lance Kuzner, who had an incredible se season or series, he was a player of the tournament batting with Alan Donald. We tied the game with Australia. We didn't lose the semi-final. But there was no super over. There was no, that was it. Australia had a superior net run rate throughout the tournament. So they then were taken through to the final and they beat Pakistan comfortably. So 1999, one more run and we could have played in the final against Pakistan. Then in, where South Africa hosted the World Cup in 2003, not for very long. I broke my finger. I was replaced by Graham Smith, but we didn't get through to the second round. The last match with uh, Sri Lanka, it happened in Durban. The rain came down as it is in Durban. And Duckworth Lewis was now in play. And Mark Boucher, batting with Lance Klusner, thought that we had the score to win the game. But Duckworth Lewis says to achieve, it's a tie, this score after this over. So he defended the last ball against Morley. Because Mark Boucher knew if he got out, it would change the rate for price. So we tied with Sri Lanka. One more run needed. But in the match in, in South Africa, the Wanderers, South Africa played against Australia. I'm now the sponsor sponsorship manager for Standard Bank and uh, two all in the series. Australia, bad first in, in Wanderers, 434. Remember that game, the 4-3-8 yep. match. And South Africa just went crazy in reply. Obviously, nobody had scored 400 before in two test playing teams against each other. And Herschel Gibbs scored 175. Grant Smith got 90 or 70 balls. And it got to the last over where Mark Boucher was batting with Andrew Hall, who was an all-rounder, but a, a bowling all-rounder. And Brett Lee was bowling. We needed six runs to win, but only two wickets were left. So we were eight wickets down. Because when you're chasing 400, everybody's yeah. just smashing boundary, boundary, sixer out, out, sixer boundary. So Brett Lee bowls the last over, defending six runs only. But Mark Boucher, importantly, has a non-striker then. But Andrew Hall manages the first ball for a boundary. So now we need two runs in five balls. The next ball, so Ricky Ponting then as a captain brings all the players in not to give the single look. And Andrew Hall tries the same shot. He's caught. But because the fielders are in the circle, Mark Boucher can't cross. Now, Mackay and Teeny is our number 11. Not a very good batsman. Just number 11. Not even number 11 batsman. Not a great batsman. And he's facing Brett Lee. He still need one to tie, two to win. So he edged the ball. Luckily, he was a little bit scared of Brett Lee. And Brett Lee bowled almost the perfect leg stump Yorker. But Mackay had backed away to square leg. He got a thick outside edge and it went to third man for a run. Just the one run. 
Mark Boucher came back on strike, hit the next ball for four. So South Africa win by one wicket, chasing 434. We scored 438. And now as a, as a sponsorship manager, I'm handing over the, the trophy to Graham Smith. I was about to give it to Ricky Ponting, and then I could give it back to Graham Smith. And I was standing next to Mackay and Teeny because I didn't stand on the stage with the dignitary. And Mackay and Teeny had this big smile on his face. I said, Mackay, you had the worst day as a far bowler, you know, your worst day ever. Why are you smiling so much? Because he had bowled his 10 overs for 89 or 90 runs. And he said, no, John T, man. He says, without my one run, South Africa lose the game. I said, what do you mean? <laughs> Herschel Gibbs, 175. Graham Smith, 90. He says, no, but if, if, if I didn't score one run, we lose by one run. And I went, of course. So it seemed impossible, 434. It seemed, it never been done before. And that's always my message, the power of one. is that. Like, McCarantini's one run allowed us to chase down 434. And if it wasn't for Makai's one run, we as a team would have fallen short, despite the amazing efforts of, of Herschel Gibbs and Graham Smith. So, you know, that's always my message to, to people when, when, I, when I'm, I'm leaving them, is that never underestimate the power of your contribution. Because too often I'll speak in organizations, um, you know, who've got maybe one lakh employees on the, around the world, not just in India, but all over the world. And they say, well, what's the point of me getting up and making a difference? Because I'm only one person, but you're not. Because I've seen that one run make a difference. So, yeah, I'm, I'm here to, to request you to get up there and be the person making the difference that gets the team across the line. So the power of one, it really is a reality. Brilliant, brilliant, Jonty. The power of one. That's something that all of us uh, do get uh, inspired by. Thank you for those uh, kind words. This is, to me, like a T20 match, right? A small one. We would have, you could have spent a lot more time with you, but uh, we'll have to stop here. But, uh, you know, really, thank you for taking time, being with us. It's, it was really awesome and inspiring. I think some of your thoughts uh, was outstanding. And, you know, as a cricketer, as a god of uh, fielding, you're still very modest about uh, your achievement. So thank you for that. So with that, viewers, we end today's uh, event. Uh, Jantli, you've set the tone for a happy weekend. So again, thanks for that. And to me, I think we had a fantastic uh, episode today. And I do hope we've learned a lot. But I do hope that our viewers were really as excited about hearing some of your views today. So viewers, thank you for taking time. Thank you for watching us. And uh, do look forward to our next episode, which uh, we'll be announcing shortly. So thank you, everyone. And uh, have a good evening. Thank you, Jonty. Thanks.